let me ask you guys this. Um, first of all, let's get initial reactions, okay? So did you like it? Did you love it? Is there anybody here that it is like their favorite one, their favorite scene? Pam, Pamela, both of y'all, this is your favorite one so far. Yeah? This is my favorite story, like in the Bible, since I was like eight. So okay. to see it kind of come to life like that was, and, and have the, you know, the fictionalized part of the story fleshed out into an actual story was pretty cool for me. So you know, I just, I don't know why I must always love that story. So it just it was good. Awesome. Well, that's great. So, um, hey, hey, Debbie. Hey, everybody from Logging On. Char, what's up, y'all? Hey, Tina. <laughs> um, okay, so the scene opens up. We're in Jerusalem, AD 8. Um, now, what's crazy about this is that when this, when this episode first got released, it was actually AD 12 is what they had in the caption. But then after the roundtable discussion, they changed it to AD 8 because the creator, Dallas Jenkins, he realized, oh, I got this mixed up. I'm off on my timeline. So they originally had AD 12, which would make Jesus like, I think 16 years old. And they were like, that's not right. That can't be right. So he had to change it to 88, which makes him around, you know, 12 or 13 years old. Um, okay, so what is going on in this scene? You can unmute yourself, anybody who wants to chime in. It was the time of the Passover uh -huh. and um, that it was just finished and they were leaving Jerusalem to go back home. And um, Mary and Joseph had gone on, was it a day's journey or so? And then they realized Jesus wasn't with yeah. them. So they left the group and went back to Jerusalem and they were searching for Jesus. And, um, you know, I think it took them three days uh, until they actually found Jesus in the temple. So is this in the Bible? Yes or no? Yeah, yes it is. So let's read it. It's Luke. Oh, let me put this in here. Let me write it. Luke 2, 41 through 52. Do you guys see that in the chat? You guys see that? Okay, just making sure. All right, so let's read it together. Luke chapter 2, 41 through 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to have a look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So just like Char was saying, yeah, we have, uh, you know, Mary and Joseph. They leave and they realize they forgot the kid. They're like, oh no! <laughs> right? It's like a Home Alone story. Kevin, Kevin, where's Kevin? Come on, Kevin! Right? And so they're uh, obviously they're freaking out. Now, how was it for you guys seeing Mary, the mother of Jesus, as frantic as she was in, in this? Hey, she's a mom. It doesn't matter. 
we're, yeah. you know, we're going to freak out <laughs> when we can't yeah. find them. I liked her comment, if not now. No, it was Jesus' comment, Jesus if mother. not now, when, to his mother. Yeah. Yeah, the, I wrote that down too, Art, mm -hmm. where he says, uh, or she says, it is too early for all this. Yeah. And Jesus puts his hand on his mom's shoulder and replies, if not now, when? And then she begs, just help us get through all of this with you, please. And that last word is shot from this angle where all you see in focus is Mary's face. And then you kind of hear this, I don't know how to describe it, but like angelic oh, music, come on. <laughs> and it's like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did you guys think about uh, Joseph in this? Anybody have any any feelings towards Joseph in this in this episode? You don't really hear much about Joseph in the Bible and stories about him or anything. So I think as a father, I mean, he was his father, <laughs> mm -hmm. that he, it was a very normal reaction to it. And but I think he kind of it was almost like he struggled with the discipline of don't do this again. But yet he knew that this was a very special child and so it was kind of a hard thing for him I think yeah and I like kind of what he said at the end do you guys remember what he said to Jesus about punishment because Jesus says something like um he says can I read and Joseph is like what do y'all remember what he said you can rub Wash your mother's feet yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna rub your mama's feet how about that you know you worried, feet. Yeah. you worried her to death <laughs> But I thought it was interesting that he um, he was so impressed with how he was conducting himself and his teachings when he found them, and how everyone that was hearing him was impressed with what he had to say too. Yeah, and it lined up really well with scripture, right? Mm -hmm. Like saying mm -hmm. that his his uh, parents were amazed, right? You know? And I thought it was also um, I feel like it was more accurate with Joseph being the one that found Jesus because in that day, like women were only allowed so far in the temple. Like there were different sections in the temple, right? Gentiles could only go so far and then women could only go so far and then men could only go so far. And then in the inner inner was only like, you know, the Pharisees or the priests. And then, um, so I thought it was kind of accurate that Joseph would be the one that goes into the temple to look for Jesus while Mary's out in the streets kind of, frantically looking around. I thought that was good too. Yeah, I, I, I didn't because I expected um, uh, Mary and Joseph to be together and to have found him in the temple. You know, yeah. And I thought, why did they do that uh, in the street? You know, um, yeah, I, I think, how far could women go in the temple? I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I think like, you know, if they were of the Jewish faith, they could go further than Gentiles, but they could not go as far as Jewish men. Right. But even they did a screenshot of when he was trying to tell her where he was you know, about his father's business and it panned up to the temple to the top. Yeah. And then she got where he was at. So that was probably in keeping with that thought of, you know, she couldn't go. Yeah. But so far. Yeah. You know, do you guys okay. think they ever had, do you guys think they ever had like these Joseph and Mary, like these just thoughts, like, can he really be the Messiah? Like they knew it, of course, because of his birth. But do you think they ever like thought, like, I don't know, maybe it, like, how could this be happening to us? Like mm -hmm. still, like even after his birth, do you guys think they ever thought that? Like, I mean, I know ultimately they knew he was the Messiah, but just, I don't know, like, it's, it's got to be weird to raise the Messiah, right? <laughs> like, right. You know, like, is this really happening to us? I don't know. Yeah, I, I feel unworthy to raise my four-year-old son. I mean, you know, I can't imagine raising the, the, the Messiah, you know. <laughs> the Messiah. I think they probably the question it a lot because, you know, he was just a, a little boy. I mean, he was growing up. He 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 was norm a normal person um 
Yes, he had special, uh, I think, probably insight and knowledge, but, you know, I just think it was hard for them to grasp how this little boy could be the savior, mm -hmm. you know, the Messiah that they were looking for. And they were looking also for a Messiah to come uh, in a different way as a king, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. As a, yeah. Right. So they were probably just waiting to see how waiting. this was going to unfold. Yeah. They, they probably had a lot of questions. Yeah. I, I think it would be very hard on them uh, knowing that he's the Messiah and not being able to tell other people yeah. uh, anything about it. The reason I say that, when I was in the Air Force, I had a top secret security clearance, and I read lots of stuff uh, coming into the communication center to make sure it was correct and all. But then when I went mm -hmm. outside and went to church and stuff, and people would be talking about current events and things, I couldn't remember, did I read it here classified or did I read it in the newspaper? So I couldn't join dis discussions a lot of times. Mm. Yeah. I was thinking that um, Jesus as a child would have acted different than the other children because he never sinned. Yeah. yeah. And so, but he yeah. had fun, as you can see in this session. Uh, yes. Had fun. As an adult. <laughs> yeah. As an adult, yeah. yeah. Now, I'm sure he did that as a kid, too. Yeah. And it had to be super hard to be his siblings. I mean, you know, you know like, oh. yeah, that's the perfect son. We're not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Why don't you be more like Jesus? Yeah. Well, um, it's Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I never thought of that. <laughs> that is, that's funny though. <laughs> All right, let's keep on going, guys. All right. Um, so then, cut to the opening music. The opening music finishes, and then scene opens in Cana, AD twenty six. What's going on? What's happening here? So Mary's with Mary's with the mother of the bride. They're they're getting ready for a wedding to take place. Yep. And so um, they're just the preparations for the wedding to begin. Yep. So we see Mary now. Flash forward, you know, however many years, what twenty years or whatever, and we see Mary is the best friend of Dinah, who is uh, whose son is the groom in the wedding. And so I thought it was really cute how Dinah like opens up the door and she like does a little skip. She's just so excited. Right, thought, she's skipping her little sandals. <laughs> yep, yeah, I thought that was super cute. Um, so I think, I think for that scene, it was just basically like an intro, establishing the relationship, who Dinah is, that Mary and Dinah are, are lifelong friends, it seems like, best friends. And then it cuts to John the Baptist and Nico. Okay, now here's a question for you guys. Is this scene found in the Bible? Uh, not that I can remember. <laughs> no. Was Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, was John the Baptist ever arrested? Yes. Yes. Yes, he was. But was he arrested because of a Pharisee going to Rome? No. No. Somebody no. wanted to sit on a platter, right? A woman. Didn't What's she? that? Yeah. No, a woman wanted to sit on a platter? Yeah. He, he um, what told Herod that um, he should not be married to the woman he was married to because he belonged to his brother or something like that. I can't remember all of that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so he basically said you're committing adultery to Herod and you shouldn't be doing that. And so here Herod served in prison. Yep. So we're going to read. It's Matthew 14, 1 through 4. Matthew 14, 1 through 4. Here's what it says. At the time, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the reports about Jesus and he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, Herod had arrested John and bound him 
and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So Herod wanted to marry his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and so he did. And John the Baptist was speaking to Herod saying, that's not right. You're not supposed to do that. And so Herod ended up just arresting him. Long story short, he's in prison. His daughter, he's having a little party. Herod is having a little party. His daughter comes out and entertains the guests by doing a little dance jig for them. And all the guests are so happy that Herod says to her, he says, whatever you want, you have my oath, you will have it. And the woman, from, or the daughter from corresponding with her mom, Herodias, um, knew that Herodias wanted uh, John the Baptist's head on a platter. And so that's what the daughter said. She goes, okay, I want John the Baptist's head on the platter. And sure enough, that's what she got. So that's when John the Baptist was killed. But it never, I want to make sure that we make that clear distinction that Never in that we know of, it wasn't recorded in the Bible that the Pharisees ever had John the Baptist arrested. Um, that's not why he got arrested. That's not why he was put to death. That's a totally different thing. But is it possible? Is it possible that John was, you know, in jail more than one time? I mean, I think it's plausible. Mm -hmm. So I, it doesn't, whenever I saw that, it's not like it broke my, my the, the barrier of realism where I was like, mm, no, that's not realistic. I, mm -hmm. think it's, I think it's very possible, right, mm -hmm. that John the Baptist was arrested. Um, mm -hmm. But it, this part is just not found in the Bible. Um, and it's so kind of like, you know, it's like Jesus oh, being arrested too, doesn't it? I mean, in a way, it kind of foreshadows, I don't know, vaguely, very vaguely, like Jesus' arrest. The concept of like, like just the general concept of like the Jew, the, the I don't know, the, inter, the interplay between the Romans and what their responsibility is and what the, um, the responsibility of the Pharisees is, I don't know, to, I, don't, I can't explain it well, but to me it seems like, it seems to like kind of mirror that in how like they were threatened by his spirituality, but but then they kind of want the Romans to ultimately deal with them so that they right. don't have like his blood on them. The right. Yep. Yeah, I didn't look at it like that, but that's a good point. I like it. Um, okay, so they start talking about, what do they start talking about? The, what, the, when Mary Magdalene when Jesus cast out the demons. You got it. Yep. So Nico is still on this pursuit of trying to figure out how in the world did this woman get healed? Because I know she was possessed by many demons. And something that I thought was really interesting is um, that uh, Nicodemus, he grabs this chair. He, he, so he's talking to John the Baptist on eye level, right? And then he grabs this chair and he pulls it over and he sits down and then he takes <laughs> off his little head garment as almost to say, like, I'm not here to talk to you as a Pharisee, as someone who's in charge over you. I really have genuine crash questions. And like the next words out of his mouth was, he takes off the hair thing and he says, tell me about your ministry. And it's like very genuine. Like he wants to know, John, Tell, tell me about your ministry because Nicodemus thinks it's John the Baptist who healed Mary. That's what he's thinking. So we see in the conversation that follows that John the Baptist uh, would not have been a fan of big buildings, mega churches, and expensive things in the church. <laughs> he says something along the lines of, I don't like your garments or what you wear because it could have, it could feed three children for an entire month, you know, mm -hmm. which uh, if you've ever gone to a small town church and then stepped into a mega church, you might've had that same uh, belief. Cause I know I did. Uh, Nico starts to get up and leave. They go through this little interchange. Uh, then John keeps him 
by refocusing on what Nico wants to know. He said, I thought you were here to talk about miracles. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus is like, okay. All right. So he sits back down. Nico and John the Baptist go back and forth. And finally, uh, Nico tells John the Baptist about the miracle with Mary. And that's pretty much the, the end of that scene, right? Um, anybody want to add anything to that? Comment on it or anything? I thought it was really interesting that um, John kind of did this, or whatever, in the film they did, um, where he said, Rome shouldn't be adjudicating Jewish law. And I guess that was Nico said that. And or, or whatever, and yeah, it sets a bad precedent, and yet that's exactly what happens with Jesus. Is yep. Rome ends up adjudicating the law uh, that they, you know, because they wanted to kill him and they could kill him. So I thought that was a very interesting foreshadowing there. So I'm sure we'll probably hear that again. Yeah, Julie, did you want to say something too? Yeah, I just thought it was interesting that they portrayed him as being homeless and almost mentally ill. I mean, not, not of course, to the point that Mary Magdalene was, but he was very um, angry almost at, at certain points and almost like a homeless person you would see in the streets. And I just thought that was an interesting concept of him. I never thought about that, you know, so... Did you like it, dislike it, or just find it interesting? I found it interesting. I kind of disliked it because it almost portrayed him in a negative light. Hmm. So, you know, I don't know. But I guess back then, if you didn't have a house and, you know, you were going around and baptizing, and <laughs> you were homeless, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it does say that he was kind of living in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, and it does kind of give that... Um, uh, the the last scene, if you remember, they called him Creepy John. Yeah, he did, like, John. He, he did eat John. the bugs. Yeah, he yeah. ate grasshoppers. Yeah, and honey, so. he, he was You're a little protein, creepy. So you know, <laughs> yep. he was in jail for so like maybe too like you hadn't you know had good sleep in a shower lately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying that he could clean up well, is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> he had the opportunity. I mean, yeah. he wasn't a jail cell. So, I mean, in that way, it was kind of nice to not see him all like hot John. And yeah. <laughs> I said, hot Jesus. I couldn't resist that. So, hot John. John. No, right? <laughs> That's so funny. We're, we're, we now have to call him Hot John now. I mean, it's. it's hot John? <laughs> Okay. All right. Keep on going. So cut to Eden, stepping on the grapes. How did you guys like uh, it? Loved it. <laughs> yeah. This is my favorite. I, I did think this was my favorite scene. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Because, all right, as a single person now, this is the kind of relationship I want to strive for. Mm -hmm. If you go to the end of it, but I'll let you talk about the scene. But at the end of it, that's the kind of relationship I think a part a true partnership should be mm -hmm. I like it I like it okay so Simon tells Eden about the bad fishing night and thanks Eden for sending Andrew and the boys thank you for that by the way he yeah. said Simon says he cast the net one more time and why why did he do it one more time do you remember what he said um, it was the way Jesus go ahead go ahead Ellie. Um, well, Jesus had made them um, fisher of men, and um, so he did a miracle by, um, put, like, there was a lot of fish, so he, like, fried them with a lot. Yeah, so Simon caught a ton of fish mm -hmm. in the past episode, and after not having catch anything all night, and he said that Jesus kind of looks at him and he says I, I don't know why I threw it and then he says but it was because of the way he looked at me it's because mm -hmm. of the way he looked at me that he had to throw that and then Simon tells the story about Elijah and Elijah Elisha I mean Elijah and Elisha yeah. I'll do it that way and so I want to read that that's in first kings let me write that in first kings 19 
19 through 21. First Kings 19, 19 through 21. It says, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. So Simon tells Eden that the teacher is the Messiah. Then he starts like recounting the story faster and faster and getting more excited, almost frantic, to get to the end before Eden kind of tells him no. Like, that's kind of the sense I got is he was like, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then that happened, and let me get to the end because I don't want you to get freaked out or say no. And then it's almost like Simon was, uh, like, worried, right, about telling Eden about it. But what is, what is Eden's response? When she was ecstatic. Easy. Yeah. She was well, she, ecstatic. She turned around. She wasn't ecstatic. She turned around first and was in tears. And he goes, oh, no, you're upset. I knew you would be. And she goes, how can I be upset? Mm -hmm. I know who he is, too. You have to go. And he sees in you what I see in you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were tears of joy because she was so yeah. excited. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. And she Perfect. said, this is the man I married. Yeah. Yes. It comes back to that because yeah. she had mentioned that before. Right. right. So sweet. Yes. So Did sweet. Anybody cry on that part? <laughs> anybody cry? I, I cry. Yes. No. Yeah. I know Sandra did. <laughs> yeah, her her exact words. Hey Goose, Goose, you can't. I'm working. He's her exact words was, "Of course he chose you." And then she says, "Because someone finally sees in you what I've always seen. You are more than a fisherman." And I was like, <laughs> "I know." <laughs> so sweet. Okay, so um, does anyone else want to say? Anything about the sweet scene before we go to the next one? I do. I, do. Um, I just, just all that stuff's great. And the more than a fisherman thing too triggered for me when, you know, Jesus said that he's not just, um, you know, Jesus wasn't just a carpenter or whatever, like his work in, you know, in a previous episode. So I don't know. It's what's, what it's speaking to me in my own life is just that, you know, the reminder that our jobs are not who we are. It's like what we do to follow Jesus that really matters. And then our jobs are just like a side impact of that. So he'll like send us into a job where he uses us. So, you know, anyway. Yeah, I agree. Okay, Don, what were you thinking? Okay, the very last line that Eden said was, uh, he said he was going to Cana that day to a wedding. And she says, what does a wedding feast have to do with liberation? They're still <laughs> all thinking that he's going to come in with an army. Yeah, that's right. That's what the Messiah is. You got it. That's exactly right. Good point. Good point. And okay. I, I loved that both of them were like, this will not be easy. Yeah. Because, you know, when we look at marriage, it's not easy and you have to work at it and here they are they have this whole nother you know aspect going in there of he's going to be traveling and going away and coming back and he's not going to be earning an income and and she's like don't worry about me we'll be fine you know mm -hmm. and i like the atmosphere they had that communication and they were both stomping the grapes together and and he's telling her and they're having that conversation. Oh, this isn't going to be easy. So the atmosphere they're in with that kind of a talk makes it easier to, as a couple to talk it out versus, you know, standing in the kitchen or in the living room and you're arguing or something. They were had an intimate moment and they were still able to talk about what it's going to involve and the traveling and all of that. So, yeah, I agree with you, Pam, on that. 
So the very last shot in that scene, did it strike anybody? The wine flowing out of the, the wine flowing out after they stamp, stamp the grapes. Mm. Yeah, did that, did that hit anybody and make you think of anything else? The blood flowing? Yeah. The foreboding. That's, that's what it, it symbolized that to me. And I was wondering if it was just me or if anybody else picked up on that. Because they were, they were stopping and the wine was flowing out of the wine press. Like Jesus' blood flowing from his body for us. And I thought, I thought, it, I, I thought it was really interesting. Did anybody else catch that? Yes. Okay. And I think, like, yeah, because I guess it's kind of what you're saying, but the, I mean, the grapes have to be like stomped and like kind of beaten in a way and and um, broken. Yeah. For the wine or the blood to flow. Yep. Okay, so now we cut to a woman loading the carriage, and we int we get introduced to another character. Who's the character that we meet? Thomas. Thomas. Um, Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. <laughs> Thomas. So I'm going to read a, a quick Thomas. little. Uh, a quick That's Thomas. where that nickname comes from, Doubting Thomas. Yep. I'm going to read a, a quick little character study. So um, Thomas had an unnamed twin brother. Uh, his first mention is in Matthew chapter 10, verse 3. His final mention is in Acts 1, 13. Thomas means twin. Uh, from, the, from the Greek, Didymus also means twin from Aramaic. Uh, he's referred to 15 times in the Bible. In five different books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, uh, he was an apostle. He was from the area of Galilee. Tradition says many believe that he died in India, and he was the first person to take the gospel to India. Uh, tradition says he died a martyr, killed by arrows as he was praying, and he was known as the Doubting Apostle. I'm going to read this short little paragraph. Here's what it says. One of the apostles, he was also called Didymus, the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name. He is said to have been born at Antioch. All we know of him is derived from the Gospel of John. From what is written about him, we can conclude that Thomas was a man slow to believe, subject to sadness, who tended to view things on the darker side and yet was full of ardent love of his master. So, um, I think that, you know, I mean, he's only mentioned 15 times in the Bible. Well, let me ask, how do you guys think his initial kind of portrayal was? Do you think it was biblically accurate? Do you think it was good? We don't know what he did as a profession, do we? So, him being the working for a vineyard... Error. Do, I mean, I don't know if that's in scripture or not. Yeah, what, Thomas? Do we know what Thomas did? I don't, I don't. Not scripturally, no. I don't think it says. Right. But I think his character, the the way they portrayed his character, it, it does give a picture of that because he um, definitely is questioning all the time. Yes. He wants to be prepared. Yes. Or overly prepared all the time. So he, he likes to, he analyzes everything. Right. Yeah. I thought that was a cool portrayal. The way he was like, how many, wait, I, I told you to bring four, not three. Wait, why'd you bring only three? Right. Okay. And Jesus a, alluded, he reminded him of Matthew. He didn't say Matthew's name, but he goes, you remind me of someone else. Yeah. Yeah. A counter. Yeah. He <laughs> yeah. was always figuring or something. Okay. So I have yeah. a question. <laughs> Does anybody feel like Thomas and Rayma kind of have like a little crush on each other. Yeah. Okay, y'all picked up on that yeah. too. Uh, yeah. They were partners in what they were doing. Right. right. Now, but that's not know. all art. <laughs> not all. They were drinking the wine together. <laughs> they were drinking the wine. <laughs> I think <Damn. laughs> it was very obvious to me that Thomas had a crush on Rayma. Yeah. Um, 
it's not as obvious. Well, let's, let's keep going. We'll talk about Rayma in just a second, but let's keep going. Okay, so, you know, they have this little thing where they're talking about the wine, and she says, as carefully as you drive, I'm sure it's going to make it there. Okay, cut to Mary and Dinah preparing for the wedding. Uh, and this is a very informational scene. And the reason why is because it talks about how Dinah was unable to afford hired help. So Dallas is now starting to paint the picture from both Thomas and Rama's scene, as well as this scene, that this family is really trying to throw this, this wedding on a budget, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of money, okay? And they're trying to do this on a budget. So we also hear that they love Sarah, the daughter-in-law, but her parents, Hila and Abner, the mom and dad, uh, not so happy about the marriage. And what we can gather from this scene is that Abner is very successful and seems very influential. And so, um, you know, Dinah is very happy that her son Asher is marrying Sarah. Uh, however, it doesn't look like from the, from the bride's side that they're very excited about it. Okay, next scene, Simon and Andrew walking to meet Jesus. Okay, I thought this was a cute little, I thought this was a cute little scene. Okay, what, what happened in this scene? They didn't know if they were supposed to pack their lunch or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to do it all wrong. <laughs> what is Andrew feeling in this scene? This one. What, what is it? What did you say? Did I said, you what, what is Andrew feeling? He was scared he was to do something wrong. He was nervous. Yeah, yeah, he was nervous. He was apprehensive. Am I going to do something nervous. wrong? Nervous, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and what does Simon say to kind of help subdue his nervousness and anxiety? Mm -hmm. Everyone doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. This, he also, he said about how Andrew like referring that he couldn't like dance. Yeah, that's a little bit later. Yeah, in the in the yeah. scene, and that's hysterical. It when is. Bring <laughs> that up, and Jesus' response to it was awesome. I it loved was. it. I loved it. Okay, so then Thaddeus, James, John, and Mary uh, enter, and Thaddeus is kind of making fun of them, and they're like, "How long were you guys standing there?" And he was like, "Oh, we we've been standing here for a little while." And then you have Big James up in the fig tree. Um, does anybody else uh, want to say anything else about this scene? Because I noticed something else, but I want to see if you guys noticed it too. It was kind of at the very end. I thought though that, well, I, one question I had about this scene was, didn't Jesus change some people's names? So I guess I thought he was going to change like the sons of, I guess we're not, are we not at the sons of thunder yet or what? Like, yeah, that's a good question. I don't think we're there yet. No. Cause I guess with the James thing, I guess I thought he would rename them. Yeah. But he didn't. He didn't. So that, that, I don't know. That confused me. The name thing confuses me for some reason. So anybody else? I mean, there's only six of the, disciples at that time mm -hmm. when he asked mary what was she gonna did she always want brothers yeah. yeah right and then wait until there were 12 yeah i think he said something about that in that scene yeah well so it's, it's two scenes from now but yeah yeah he does say that too yep okay so here's what i noticed and, and i don't know if if i was just looking too closely or not but james the brother of jesus is known as James the Just, right? Like the James who wrote the book of James, okay? He's Jesus' brother, and he's known as James the Just. Well, when he says to small James or little James, whatever, he, I forget what he Young calls. James. Young. young. He yeah. says, how does that sound to you, young James? And young James makes this comment, and he goes, he said, Jesus says something like, oh, that's great, and it's very, it's very just or something. Yes, like that. right. He did. And I was like, hmm. Mm -hmm. So are they going to blend James, the brother of Jesus, 
with young James right here. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you got big James and little James. So how's it going to play out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it was interesting because young James is not the brother of Jesus. No. Big James is not the brother of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? The brother of Jesus did not believe Jesus was the Messiah until after Jesus was crucified yeah, yeah. and then resurrected. That's mm -hmm. when he was like, oh, you are the Messiah. Um, so it just, it was, I'm wondering if they're going to try and combine the two James because there's four I different James not. mentioned in the Bible. And so it was just a question. I was like, I wonder if anybody else picked up on that. Did anybody else pick up on that? Did it bother anybody else? I didn't pick up on it, but I've always thought, I mean, I thought they were close with the naming of the Jameses. So I know that they called one of them young James, but I've always heard it refer, heard them refer to as James the Great and James the Less. The Lesser. Yeah. The lesser, yeah. Yep. Yep. That's what I've heard too. Okay. All right. So cut back to Dinah and Mary looking at the uh, hoopa, the hoopa, I guess. We hear uh, again, Rafi, uh, Oh, uh, Dinah says, Rafi and I got what we paid for, and it looks cheap. And we again see that they don't have a lot of money. Enter Hella. Um, and what does, what does Hella do? What does she, wh why is she there? To he make sure to that. The... Oh, go ahead, Don. Go ahead. He wants to get the best place at the table for her husband. Yep. Mm -hmm. And did anybody notice, like, the introduction where Dinah sees Hella and she tries to go in for a hug? Yeah. And, you know, she's, like, nope. she's, like, <laughs> she's like, no. She's like, these are yeah. coronavirus times. We cannot touch. She was social distancing. <laughs> I was about to say. Social distancing was already a thing. It's funny because that's exactly what I thought of. I was like, man, that has been happening so much to me where I like go in for a handshake and people are like, ooh, ooh, no. And I'm like, yeah, I got you. My bad, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's one of those things. I think we can all relate to that being on the, the opposite end of that. Um, okay, so she wants a spot at the table and there's kind of this little thing where Dinah doesn't give in where she's like, we've already selected a place. I hope this is important enough where, you know, um, Abner can understand that we've already kind of arranged it. And then the final line of this scene, do you remember what it is? The hoop is crooked. The hoop is crooked. Stop <laughs> <laughs> being so judgmental, y'all. Come on. <laughs> right. Crooked. She wanted, she wanted perfection. Like, she wanted to be perfect. Yeah. Yep. She's a perfectionist. She's got money. She knows how it should be. And she wants it to be that way. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. Okay. So cut to Jesus leading the disciples to Cana. Simon approaches Jesus to talk to him about recruiting more followers. Again, going back to, I think it was Dawn that said that they're still thinking liberation here, right? Simon's like, Hey, at this wedding, there's going to be some powerful people, some people who have money maybe this is a good a good time to kind of talk and get more followers because you know he doesn't say this but he's kind of thinking if we're going to raise an army you know we got to feed an army we got to be able to get an army through those weapons we need money we we got to get some money so this might be a good time to do that and what is jesus response well it's not about him yeah yeah so humble mm -hmm. this day's not about me Go ahead, Don. He said that a very important person would be there. Mm -hmm. Zima. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And you know what else I caught? Zima. <laughs> Andrew threw in, oh, I thought she was from Nazareth. Yeah. I mm -hmm. see that the whole time. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I it's a Dallas running joke. Yeah, it's a Dallas running joke it's about a <laughs> good cop from Nazareth. Yep. <laughs> All right, so Jesus says, um, I was the clumsy teenager who cracked my head open at Asher's when he was a child. Uh, and Dallas is giving us a little bit of backstory of Jesus and helps the audience to see him as a boy, even though we have very little biblical text from this time in Jesus' life, right? Um, 
And then Jesus asks uh, Mary if she thought of having brothers like Tina said. Mm -hmm. And she says, I always wanted to have brothers as a little girl. And Jesus says, well, soon you're going to have 12. And everyone's like, what, 12? And Jesus says, you'll see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, anybody else want to talk about anything in this scene before we go to Mary and Dinah again? Well, I think it's neat that they're including Mary because I know, like, I don't know. Yeah. There's not a lot in the Bible about her, but I know that a lot of Bible scholars say that she was probably, that she was moving around like that with Jesus and the, and the disciples. And, but the culture of the time would not have let them put that in the Bible. Like culturally, people wouldn't have made a record of that in the Bible so much. Right, yeah. Because of the culture, but not because of Jesus. Right, exactly, yep. All right, so. <laughs> Cut to Mary talking to Dinah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through this real fast so that we can keep on going because uh, we're almost out of time, but, you know, obviously we're going to stay on later. But um, Mary is talking about her wedding and how it was different because she was pregnant. If uh, Joseph was here, he would be so proud of you and Rafi. Um, so we know Joseph has already passed in this scene, right? He's no longer around. Uh, Mary tells Dinah that he is coming and may bring some special guests. Oh, talking about Jesus. Uh, Dinah says to bring them on, more guests. The problem is there's no more money. So could this be a problem for the wedding feast? Uh, yeah, we're about to see that. Okay, what I want to do is just stop real fast, though, and, an and analyze how Dallas, the creator, is creating this tension right now in this episode surrounding the wedding feast more guests, limited money, wanting to impress the in-laws, having all of Dinah's family and friends at the party, spending all their remaining resources on good wine. Dallas is layering all of these things together in order to help to add to the drama that's to come next, right? And Dinah and Rafi go to taste the wine. Thomas introduces Rama as the finest, most beautiful venture in all of Galilee. And then we soon find out that Rama is the daughter of Rafi's old friend, Cap. Not sure why this uh, information is important. I'm thinking this is gonna come up later because it's just a random bit of information that we're introduced now that we have no idea why it's important. So uh, why wouldn't he just leave it out? I think, I think it means something. Um, but I mean, the wine was supposedly very good too. So maybe, you know, because of their friendship, he gave him the finest. Maybe, maybe that's what it was. See, I didn't even catch up, catch on that, Tina. That's good. I didn't even think about that. And then she, uh, here, she here does not drink. <laughs> that's an opinion. <laughs> Rayma compliments Thomas. This is where I was thinking maybe Rayma does have a crush on Thomas because she compliments Thomas by saying, Thomas is never late. And I was like, ooh. Is she like, is she like, is that like a, a subtle hint? Is that a, the way a girl is flirting as opposed to Thomas being like, hey, you know, I think you're great. Uh, I don't know. It's an interesting pickup line. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, okay. He's never late. He's never late. He doesn't even have to stop and ask for directions. <laughs> he does oh. believe, he does believing in him just like Eden was believing in Simon. Yeah, that's good. Um, do you guys think that uh, Rayma will be a follower? Do you think she will be considered one of the women in this story? Okay. Yeah, possibly about because that. Because she said that. Um, what, I can't deny that a miracle happened here or something. Isn't she the one who said that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So Rafi, uh, he says, oh, yes, that's the oldest trick in the book, right? Of course, doing the, the wine, the good wine first and then the bad wine last, you know, making sure that they're all, you know, well fed and then giving them the bad wine. Um, the magical number, the head count, 40. That's 40. 40 is what they're looking for. Enter Jesus and the disciples, and then 
he gives Mary this big hug, which is so beautiful. I just love. Um, and then we cut back to John the Baptist and Nico. Um, and John the Baptist says, it has begun. Mm -hmm. If he's healing in secret now, the public signs cannot be far off. Nico asks for his name um, and if John the Baptist knows him. And John the Baptist responds with Proverbs 34. And here's what it says. It says, who has gone up to heaven and come down? Whose hands have gathered up the wind? Who has wrapped up the waters in a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is the name of his son? Surely you know. Hmm. And then Nico kind of says, uh, you're, being, um, you're being careless with Torah, he says. Before that, he said, don't quote Solomon. Tell me his name. <laughs> he says, what? Wait, say it again, Pam. He says, don't quote Solomon at me. Yeah. Yeah, don't quote Solomon at me, you mongrel. Or something like that. <laughs> did he did he say, you know, God doesn't have a son? Yeah. Yeah. He said yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Israel is yeah, God's he said only that son. God's only son is is Israel. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. To which uh John the Baptist's response is suit yourself. And then John the Baptist quotes Isaiah, I S A I A H forty three through five that we're gonna read which is a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Um, and Nico kind of gives John the Baptist this little, if this is if this is who you say, you being in this region puts him in danger, type of type of warning. Um, okay, then cut to wedding event. Woohoo! Uh, Thomas is giving instructions to the servants. Rama comes inside and she is very upset because now the head count is what? Eight. Eighty. Eighty. 80. 80. All At the least. guests. We're seeing they're dancing. They're making a toast to the bride and groom. We see everyone drinking and drinking and enjoying the wine. <laughs> Thomas is teaching the servants how to make the wine go further. The banquet master comes in as Thomas and Rima are kind of freaking out a little bit. And the banquet master says, the guests seem happy so far, but the servants do not. How are we doing? And Thomas is like, oh, we're good. Don't worry about us. We're good. You're a great master of the banquet, by the way. <laughs> and he kind of uses his right. To get the master of the banquet to leave, right? And then um, he says, uh, okay, so enter, um, what's her name? What's Abner's wife's name again? I forget. Asher? Is it Sarah? I an H. And then Hila. Ab Abner's wife. Hila. Hila. Hila, Hila. Okay, so enter, enter Hila and Abner, and he, uh, Abner says it's the best party he has been to in a long while. Then he expresses how he wasn't always happy about this arrangement because Dina was born in Nazareth, uh, and <laughs> Rafi's trade hasn't made him much money. And he goes, oh, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be rude. And what I thought was interesting was the wife's reaction to all this. Did you guys see how like Dallas made sure to kind of get some of the wife's mm -hmm. reaction? Mm -hmm. uh, Abner was talking. What was her reaction? You fool. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, good. He's at it again. Yep, that's, 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 that's what I thought. Here he goes again. Just be patient with the man. Will, did you notice earlier that Abner had a brass chalice to drink out of and he was holding it up with his rings and all mm -hmm. and he still has that chalice here but later he'll be drinking out of a clay vein. oh Gone. i didn't notice that transition art yeah 
I thought he kept the uh, the chalice the whole time, but no, no. he the change. Once uh, Jesus turned the water into wine. Yeah, you're right. I didn't notice that. That's good. Good call. Um, and then the last line is he looks at his wife and he says, "I thought you said this was crooked." Um, you know, and <laughs> kind of threw his wife under the bus. I was like, "Way to mm. go, man!" Um, good that was just, to me, that was just a very real scene because you know that goes on in families all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then for him to ask him, "Well, you may not have known that we weren't happy," you know, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> People know, yeah. Yep, and then he says, this wine is delicious. I need to know the vineyard, you know. He was just a little bit sloshed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little, a little bit. Okay, cut to Rama and Thomas. Uh, what is Rama's idea about how to fix the headcount problem? To water it down. Water it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Add water to the wine. Uh, and And Thomas was like, oh, we can't do that. They're going to tell. And Rama says the family would be shamed. And, and Thomas is like, what about us? We would be ruined. And then, <laughs> what's, what's Thomas' idea? What's his idea? Solve the food. <laughs> Get them dates. Make them thirsty for water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's funny. And then we see the evening wind on. The lights start to fade to darkness. Candles start to get lit. That gives us an idea that time is progressing and everyone is still drinking. We see everyone having a wonderful time. Meanwhile, Thomas and Rama are freaking out. Cut to the disciples around the table. They see Jesus with the children. And what is he doing? He's playing, playing games. games. He's playing games. He's playing games. Yeah, he's having fun with the kids. This is easy for him, right? We just saw that episode. What was it? Episode two? Three. Episode three. Where I just uh, love I just love how Jesus has shown he's fully man and fully God. It's yep. just you know, me too, Melody. I, agree. I, I love the realness. I feel like um, that also uh, Jesus was like acting like like a kid, like he was being like a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just it's just wonderful to see him kind of talking to kids and how he interacts with kids. I love it. And then Mary says, uh, you know we get to stay with Jesus and, and his mother. We're the lucky ones. And Andrew asked, well, where will that be? And we get some sense that Andrew is now kind of going from nervous to worried. Like, you know, are we going to be warm tonight? Uh, what are we going to eat? How are we, where are we going to stay? All of that sort of <laughs> thing. Um, and then Andrew says he's going to get more wine. Simon says, you know, I don't know why I'm even here. And then we learn how Thaddeus meets Jesus. How does <laughs> Thaddeus meet Jesus? On a job site. On a job site. That's oh, yeah. right. On a, oh, on a yeah. particular kind of job site. <laughs> and Simon's like, oh, what were you building? And he's like, a public service utility. Right. He's like, oh, you were building an aqueduct. And he goes, no, not yeah. quite. <laughs> He's like, what is it, man? And he's like, it's not proper to talk about with a lady around. And then Mary's like, I'm, I've heard things that would make your blood turn cold or something like that. Ice. 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 Turn the ice, yeah. Um, so ends up, how did he meet them? What were they building? A latrine. A latrine. And Simon's like, let's not tell Andrew about that. That would not be a good idea. Except Jesus was building the handicap rats. Yes. Yeah. You know, and I thought that was really kind of a cool thing to throw in there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I thought Peter's question is a really cool question because he says, well, why didn't he just heal them? <laughs> and so they could go up the steps themselves. And, <laughs> and then Mary's response is because he always says that um, his time has not yet come. Mm -hmm. And so now they're discussing the miracles. And I think this is where Dallas is trying to work in that i know the fish miracle i said you know in the last episode is when the fish miracle happened but technically that was a private miracle this one is more of a public miracle and so that's kind of how dallas is trying to fit this into the timeline did you guys get a sense of that yeah. mm -hmm. yep okay cut to thomas emptying the last bit of wine and dinah says Thomas, talk to me. 
and then it's quick cut to Jesus walking down a hallway, seeing Simon and Andrew. Ah, you sons of what? What are they? What does he call them? Miriam. Song. No. What is? What is it? The song. Sons of Thunder. Is it the Sons of Thunder? No, it's it's. And he says Jonah. Yeah, Sons of Jonah. 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 Oh, that's yeah. it. He goes, Sons of Jonah, right? And um, I love how we get a picture of Jesus hanging out with his disciples and deepening some of these relationships here. Like, it's like Jesus is, is a person, you know, and we're able to connect with him in a, a more real level, I feel like, here. Yeah. That's what I love about this. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and, he has uh, a fun personality. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. And then he talks about Andrew uh, having four left feet. Uh, Jesus laughs. Enter Mary. Uh, uh, oh, enter Mary. And what does she tell Jesus? We're out, out. out of wine. <laughs> We're <laughs> out. <laughs> it's all gone. Not a drop left. And it was such a panic. It was such yeah. a terrible thing <laughs> yeah, because everything is on the line at this moment everything is on the line for this family mm -hmm. and jesus responds why are you telling me this and she says we can't let the celebration end like this and asher's family humiliated and then jesus tells simon and andrew to go join the others he pulls his mom away from everyone and he says to his mom mother my time has not yet come and she puts her hand on top of his hand and says the lines, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the exact same uh, question it, that he asked her as a child. And then we get that look of her face. Um, and she says, please. And then we see this look on the face of Jesus filled with so much compassion and he doesn't even say a word like he just takes a breath and in that breath he realizes what is about to happen he is about to set something in motion that can never be reversed and in that short breath he seems to be looking into the future and making the decision to help his mother in the present but save the world for all eternity and Jesus seems very heavy in that moment and I just start bawling because mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, <laughs> and then at this point, I'm like, I feel way too emotional. I got to pause this for a second and collect myself <laughs> because this is a wedding and this is supposed to be happy. <laughs> I got to get my, I got to get my emotions in check. I know, right? It's so funny. Yeah, I, I felt really bad because I'm like, Jesus did this and He's standing there just smiling, and he's not getting any credit at all. No one's crediting him for this. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, none of the apostles are saying, oh, it's not us. It's him that did this miracle. No, I mean, but he doesn't want the recognition, right? Oh, I know that, but I felt bad for him. <laughs> I know. And then, and then Mary goes to Thomas and Rama, and she says, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Cut to Thomas. And Jesus in the room with the empty jars. And what does Jesus tell him to do? Leave. What's that? He told them to leave. leave no, not yet. Not yet. He tells them before he tells them to leave. He tells them to do what? Go ahead, Alejandra. He tells them like, to fill them like with water. Yep. To fill them with water. And doubting Thomas, I love him, right? I would respond the exact same way. Uh, we need wine, not water. And I was under the impression that you were able to help us out in our big crisis. So if you're not going to help us out, I don't have time for this. I got to figure out another solution. <laughs> and, uh, and, oh, these are the exact words. Thomas says, from the directions you provide, I see no logical solution to the problem. And Jesus' response is so simply... It's going to be like that sometimes, Thomas. <laughs> and then Jesus tells him that it's good to ask questions and I don't rebuke you. 
Uh, then he tells, uh, tells him about a man in Capernaum always counting and measuring, which we know he's referring mm -hmm. to Matthew. 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 <laughs> and Jesus says, join me and I'll show you a new way to count and measure, a different way of seeing time. And Thomas seems interested but questions because he doesn't understand. Cut to Abner. Wait, wait, can we go back a sec? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Because um, the jars, he talked about the jars. Mm hmm and hold on let me read my notes it says they were jars of purification and were, they were made of stone and he asked thomas why are they made of the stone and it's because the stone is pure and less likely to break and cannot be made unclean and i'm like that you know that whole thing is you know jesus is pure he, he cannot be made unclean and he's going to be poured out as our sacrifice so there's some kind of, you know, foreshadowing in that whole thing with that stone. I haven't quite figured it out yet, but I know there's got to be something there because that was so, such a specific thing with the purity and, and Jesus being, you know, completely. With your, your stone, uh, the first cut in stone, you cannot stop because mm -hmm. it will leave, it, it will never be the same. So once the, if there's a mistake, they've got to throw it away. Yep. So, and Jesus is the cornerstone. Yep. I love that. Yeah, that's good. I, I put down in here, you know, that I think it's not a coincidence how Dallas weaved the purification stone with the fact that Thaddeus is a stone mason. And mm -hmm. he's about to talk about the work he does with stone and how it is different than the work of a blacksmith. Uh, but that's a little bit further ahead. Um, so Abner runs out of wine. He calls to Dinah. He wants more wine. Mary comes in, saves the day in front of Abner. More wine? Yes, it's coming. It's coming. No worries. It'll be right here. Mary and Thaddeus, Mary Magdalene now and Thaddeus has this great conversation about a stonemason. Then Thaddeus talks about the difference between being a stonemason and a blacksmith. And this monologue is over the top of the next few shots. And I think it's just beautiful, artistic beauty. Um, and Jesus tells everyone to step outside, including Thomas. And then that's where you hear Thaddeus say, once you make that first cut into, yeah. into the stone, it can't be undone. It sets in motion a series of choices. What used to be a shapeless block of limestone or granite begins its long journey of transformation, and it will never be the same. And it's this idea that Jesus is about to perform his first public miracle. Once this happens, there is no take backsies. Mm -hmm. Jesus must go to the cross. He must be tortured. He must be beaten. He must die for us. And I just loved how they incorporated that monologue over Jesus looking at this, all of these jars. And then Jesus says, I'm ready, Father. And it's like this, this acknowledgement between God the Son and God the Father. Mm -hmm. I'm ready, Father. And the music starts. I know the music. <laughs> <laughs> and he sticks his hand. Yeah. He sticks his hand into the water and comes out wine. But you know, I noticed too that when Jesus was turning the water to wine, he didn't have. He really didn't have anyone present there with him when he did that. Mm -hmm. He he asked everyone to leave. Mm -hmm. So it was a public display of a miracle in that the wine was, he created the wine, he, he produced the wine, but no one really saw him do it. Yeah, I so, think the reason that it's a public miracle, because I thought about that too, Melody, I think the only thing I can think of, of the reason it's a public miracle is because he did the miracle and everyone that experienced the miracle and that saw the miracle was not asked to then become his disciple. Because if you remember, 
he did the uh, he did the miracle. He walked out, and Rima and the other servants go in, and they see that it is now wine, and they le- they right. shout this huge excitement. Right. And now they are going to tell everyone else. Right. Because he has not invited them to follow him. Yeah. I mean, others hear of it and they see evidence of yeah. it, that it, that it's there, but they, no one really saw him do it. Didn't yeah. see him actually perform it. So right. and those miracles are coming later. <laughs> right. Yep. He's and working up to it. I think, I think right. right after this is when the master of the um, banquet says his part and that's to everybody. Yep. I am. Um, I stepped away for a second. Did anyone say anything about limestone and what's unique about limestone? Yeah. No, tell us about what's unique about limestone. Well, in Bermuda, they in Bermuda they make their roofs out of limestone because then they take the rainwater and the rainwater runs off and they store it in their basement and the only thing that they use to purify the rainwater is the limestone. Oh, so So what? I said limestone purifies the rainwater? That's in Bermuda. Yeah, that's what they say. I never knew that, Allison. I had no idea. I guess lime. I guess lime is kind of like an equalizer or something. I don't know that much about science. I just know that if you go on a tour in Bermuda, they tell you that. (laughs) That's why the roofs are made out of limestone. I didn't know that. That's interesting. I wanted to say one other thing. Yeah. When Jesus' hand come out of the jar and he's making a fist and the wine is falling out of his fist, I'm going, oh, wow. He's on the cross. Oh, Um, yeah. yeah. This is the one scene that made me call all my friends and say, you got to see this. This was such a profound moment when he stood there to make this decision with his father oh yeah it looked like the blood dripping off his hand yeah right. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. do you think dallas thought about that intentionally or do you think it just happened and it was this happy accident I think no i think it was intentional it was intentional yeah okay See, this is, we need to get Dallas on this video call. So, I know. I know. You know, you I need mean, to hook us up, Will. <laughs> I need to hook us up. I got to pull my string. Hook us up with Dallas, man. Yeah. <laughs> that could be our next unplugged session. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, maybe you can get a role in it, too. You're an actor, aren't you, Mary? Oh, no. Yeah. No. Nope. No way. All right, cut to Master of the Banquet, tasting the wine, and he says, he says what? Stop the music. Stop the music. <laughs> and he talks about, you know, yeah. typically this is how it plays out, but this is different. This is the best wine I have ever tasted. Right? Mm-hmm. And Abner looks at Rafi and points mm-hmm. at Rafi as if saying, oh, I see what you did there. And then Rafi <laughs> is like, oh, well, you know, it's no big deal. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw that little exchange between uh-huh. the two. I thought that was hysterical. Yeah. I was like, Raffi's playing it out like, oh yeah, I knew this was going to happen the whole time. <laughs> I got the thing. I'm in. Plan. <laughs> and then, um, and, oh, okay. And so Abner's wife, I thought this is the price for admission right here, right? This is what this is all about. Abner asked, or Abner's asked, is something wrong by his wife? And his response for me, makes the entire episode. He just says simply, yes, Mm -hmm. I was. Yeah. And I made a note. I said, when one prideful person can admit when they were wrong, that might just be a bigger miracle than the water into wine because Mm -hmm. a heart was changed and a family was one at -hmm. that moment. That's me. Go ahead. That's good. I also thought about it in terms of, because I noticed the the cup changing too, that he no longer had the gold or brass chalice. He had the pottery, um, the wine with pottery. And in my mind, I'm thinking he said that, and I'm like, Jesus did that. Like, Jesus changes us, and we're seeing that in Abner, 
you know, through this whole thing is that he was this, you know, arrogant, prideful person and he got changed. He drank the wine and he got changed. And, you know, we, you know, it says we, we take the bread and drink the wine that is the body of Christ and we become changed. And so that's how I looked at it. I'm like, oh, communion, <laughs> you know? Um, so I don't know. I just that's struck in my head that, that, you know, he got changed because of Good point. And Jesus is the potter, and you can take, he pr couldn't take the brass and mold it again. I mean, they'd have to melt it down and all, but the clay, he could mold it and change. Yeah. Alejandro, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, regards to, uh, yeah, Jesus is the potter, or like the clay, so he, like, yeah, he molds us. Yeah. I think, you know, now that, now that uh, we're kind of talking about this wine, I'm seeing more clearly now, that's why I love these discussions. It's because what I learned from you guys, I see more clearly now the intention of creating this episode where wine and the blood is almost simultaneous. Yeah. The wine pouring out of the wine press, I notice the blood like his hand coming out of the wine and that being the blood, mm -hmm. them drinking the wine being the blood, what you were saying, Pam, I mean, like, I didn't, I didn't really think about it like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is a beautiful, beautiful image. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you guys for that. And then Mary looks around. So we see this shot. Oh, I love this. Mary looks around and she's looking for her son and she makes eye contact with Jesus. And I don't know about you guys, but I just started weeping again. So this is my third time crying on this episode. I was struggling with that again, though. Like when I said in another episode about the darkness, I know it was dark. It was like nighttime, but it's like, it was so hard to see the, I think, I feel like I wish they would need use a little bit more lighting because it was kind of, I don't know, maybe it's my, maybe it's my uh, video display. Are you watching on TV or a computer? I've done both where I, well, not TV. I've done computer and I've done my phone. Huh. But both ways, it's like very, when they get those dark scenes, it's like really hard to see anything. Did you guys see the extra footage where this was like filmed at, I want to say three o'clock in the morning? Or four yes, it was the very last scene of the whole season and yep. they filmed it at 3 a.m. I was like, wow, yep. <laughs> late night. It was the very last scene that they filmed in the entire season. Cause you guys know when they do film, they film it all out of sequence. Right. That's what makes it so hard for actors because they have to connect what their character is going through in this storyline, even though they're filming it first and it actually comes after, you know what I mean? And that's why filming, like film acting is so much different than theater acting. It's because they have to figure out where there's their storyline, where the arch is and all of that. So yeah, I, I, I saw that on the extra credit and I was like, oh man, three o'clock in the morning, what a long day on set. Like mm -hmm. it's 3 a.m. We're still going guys, you know, hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> and then cut to Thomas he's standing in the room by himself just looking like trying to understand how this is possible in the same way that Matthew was standing on the beach kind of after the fish right trying to figure out how is this possible yeah. and then cut to Jesus this last scene um Simon sees him and says fish wine what will be next <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and Jesus, what does he talk about? What's next? <clears throat> says, Andrew's dancing. <laughs> yeah, he says we have an evaluation to do, right? Uh, Andrew, uh, dancing? There's a problem, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we got a problem, and he's so serious, you know. Yeah. So Andrew starts dancing. <laughs> right? And then Simon says, so will you help him? And then Jesus says what? There's some things even some I, things can't, even do. I can't, I can't do. <laughs> right. That was I great. Love, love that. What did you guys think about that? <laughs> I loved it. it makes them even more <laughs> is, is it challenging for you guys to see Jesus in that way? No. Yes, I love it. I love it. You, you love it. <laughs> love okay, it. Alejandro, what did you want to say? Yeah. 
Well, I love how uh, they portray Jesus having a sense of humor. Yeah. 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 Yes. He has yeah. to be funny. He ha we yeah. are created in his image, and there's a lot of people that are funny. So he has I mean, to be. Look at all of us. We're funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're all a little weird. <laughs> I think in the um, uh, Dallas in in those behind the scenes things, didn't uh, he say that he was really questioning whether or not to put that joke in there because uh, that yeah. might offend some people? And then um, they did it on a uh, sample audience, and everybody burst out laughing and and just really appreciated the humor. So they mm. decided to leave it in. Right. That's well, makes them more relatable and human, you know, so mm -hmm. again, we can actually relate with them. And reflecting back, the other thing I really like about um, the disciples, you know, uh, just all, the, nobody knows what they're doing, you oh. know, and they're just winging it and um, mm -hmm. they're nervous. What is this like? I mean, they're just common fishermen. They're not educated but they've been called mm -hmm. and that's just the neat thing is everybody's trying to just kind of go along and take it one day at a time like scripture tells us to do don't worry about tomorrow tomorrow has enough worries of its own you know just live live for the lord today and take care of things so yeah i just i love the way he's doing this it's so neat mm -hmm. All right, so let's read John 2, 1 through 11. Let's see what the Bible says about this scene, shall we? Sure. All right, John 2, 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have, to, have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here at Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed a few more days. So that's the way the Bible depicts it. And then now let's look at this final scene because this one of these lines is how we're going to end and it's the perfect way to end um you see thomas just standing there looking at at jesus and rama comes to him and she says who is he i can't pretend i didn't see a miracle and then here she says this next line he gave us more than we need and doesn't that just encapsulate, encapsulate god so well he gives us more than we need. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's how we're going to end it is you can count on Jesus. You can count on God to give you more than you need because that's what he's good at. All right, go ahead, Char. Um, it just hit me now when you were saying that is that she was the one who was um, – I want to say stingy is the right word, um, you know, with the wine, you know, uh, Thomas was saying, let's just put one more in. And she was like, no, no, they only paid for three and uh -huh. um, yeah. we don't have to give them anymore. 
And uh, here she saw that in their desperation of need not to be humiliated because this was their responsibility, Jesus came through and gave them more than they needed, you know, mm -hmm. over and above. And that's what God promises if we'll just trust him. Mm, that's good. Well said. Well said. Awesome. Any uh, final, final thoughts? I'm just not sure how they had enough food. That concerned me. <laughs> <laughs> With all that wine, they didn't need to work. <laughs> Be careful, so, that. There's a big difference in feeding 30 or 40 and feeding 80. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no kidding. And we, we get a preview of next episode because uh, he, Thomas tells Raina that he was invited to join Jesus and to meet him in Samaria in 12 days. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you want to add something, Dawn? Um, <coughs> that, that really like hit, hit me um, before the silly dance with Andrew. He's, uh, <laughs> Simon says, fish, wine, what's next? And Jesus says, any suggestions? And I, if P, uh, Simon says, I'll follow you to the end of the earth. Mm. And that struck me like the denial of three times. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus turned to the, the funny dance with Andrew. He, he knew. Yeah. Mm. It was sad. And all of a sudden he made it happy. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good catch. Good catch. Awesome. I, I oh. did a little quick thing on the I search, Google search on um, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And according to like one person who wrote something on Google, it, Nazar Nazareth means the branch and Jesus is the righteous branch. So um, the implication there is that like thinking that there's not a worthy line or lineage that comes out of Nazareth. Hmm. Is what other people thought, you know. Right. About it. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in on this Wednesday <laughs> night. Thanks for staying awake. I know it's late, nine o'clock. Uh, <laughs> yes. Is it your <laughs> past year bit? Um, Thank you, Will. You did a great job. Yes. Okay. You're doing great jobs on these, Will. I really enjoy them. Oh, yeah. thanks, Diane. I appreciate so it. I love you guys. Thank you. It was enjoyable. Bye, Thank guys. you. Good night. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.